The Game Schooler Podcast is a weekly audio show that educates new and experienced gamers about the awesomeness of tabletop gaming. In this week's episode, we'll cover Draft and Write Records, our Game of the Week, discuss lessons from the Gen Con consignment sale in the School of Gaming, and wrap it up by revealing our High Five Essential Expansions. Welcome to the Game Schooler Podcast. I'm your host, Doug Kotecki, along with my co-host, Dr. Michael McCabe. How's it going, Michael? What's happening, Doug? How are you? Good. I feel like I haven't talked to you in a week. Yeah, it's been a week. It's, <laughs> it's been a whole week. And listeners who listen week in and week out, I mean, they, they kind of, they probably know us. They know us better than a lot of our own family members. Uh, but I just want to take a moment. So... I'm in the gym this past Sunday for open gym, which is where I am about 44 Sundays out of the year at four o'clock. And my full-time job, I work for the state education agency. All right. But I I have two real passions outside my faith and my family. I I love board games, obviously doing a podcast with you. Episode 185 hats off to us and basketball. So I'm a high school varsity basketball coach at a local school and I'm in the gym And there's a football coach who's walking in, getting ready to go to his Sunday night practice. And I hear the esteemed Dr. Michael McCabe. (laughs) And I kind of did, uh, what? There's only one man that I know that calls me that. (laughs) And here's an awesome human standing in front of me that I've never talked about. Board games or the Game Schooler podcast. And he goes on to say that, him and his wife have been binging it all summer, and they're playing games. They're playing awesome. Tiny Towns. They're playing Machi, Machi Koro. They're into episode 90. And it's just like, you know, that's awesome. We, yeah. we left off last week talking about how, how great um, it, just the positive community on our Discord and how our listeners are so engaging, excited to hear about games that people are playing. And, and when you just hear, like, you know, here's a football coach and a teacher – a great guy who, who's just starting to get into the hobby. Um, it was a chest out, big time smile moment that I wanted to make sure I, I shared with you. Um, yeah. You know, so I wanted wanted to let you know that that was pretty. That's cool. awesome. I uh, was in uh, Walt Disney World this past week uh, on vacation, which was a delight. And when I came home, and I, I was fairly checked out of everything non-family um didn't text my parents didn't basically didn't talk to anybody i was in my cocoon with my family enjoying that time and uh we record on on wednesday and it, today was my first full day back in the office and i opened up our discord and i was just like brought a gigantic smile to my face and the amount of conversation and the things that happened in the course of a week since I last checked Discord, was really cool to see all of the the different actions. Nor and and it it was different because normally I'm kind of keeping up on it on a daily basis and yeah. you don't really notice it. And then, um, being gone from it for a week and then checking in, it was like wow, there's a lot of different avenues and things that people are sharing and stuff. So really cool. Um, I'd like to talk about Disney for a little bit, if I please do. If I can, uh, and I will it, keep it, it. Is it is your podcast? So yeah. please do. Part partly, um, and it, I will try and keep it game related. On the plus side, I won Disney. I've I've beaten it, the game, the system. <laughs> However, my wallet and waistline did not. They are <laughs> <laughs> the biggest biggest losers of the week. Um, but getting into so the game. So one will hopefully grow back and the other will hopefully trim down? Correct, yes. Ball and waistline? Yeah. Okay. Hopefully we'll get back into equilibrium at some point. Um, but there is one thing that I did notice compared to the last time that I went, which was about two years ago. I don't know. Whenever Hurricane Ian was, I got caught in that while we were down there. But the difference in the 
board game selection in the stores. So if you've ever been to Disney World, there are four major parks, and each park has a metric ton of stores and shops littered throughout the parks. And, you know, in, in a lot of it, you see the same stuff in every store, that type of thing. And um, But, you know, I keep a, an eye out for what board games are in there. And what was really? interesting. You do. Yeah, that, weird that that would happen. <laughs> but what was interesting this time compared to last time is that there was a lot more of kind of rebranded mass market games. So think, you know, uh, a villain's version, a Disney villain's version of Clue and uh, a Candyland version and, and things like that compared to two years ago when it was dominated by Ravensburger and Funko games with things like the Jungle Cruise game and the Haunted Mansion game. Um, uh, Disney animated wasn't out yet, but all the, the Funko branded games and, and things like that that were not there this time, which was yeah. interesting with the... I thought Lorcana would have a bigger presence than it did, but it didn't seem like that was in every store and even if it wasn't a store it was basically starter packs or or the new gateway version but it's an interesting thing the way that um with goliath buying out the funko games division um Ravensburger has that new uh what is it chronicles of light or something that yep. there's a yep. disney princesses game i, I chronicles thought that of light. Would, yep i thought that would be in there and and featured more prominently and i'm just kind of curious I've got a, a school of gaming to topic coming up in a couple weeks um, where I read an article about the, the big box stores gaming selections changing compared yeah. to what they are. And I, I have some thoughts on that, but it was a very interesting observation that I, I wasn't really expecting. I assumed I'd see more of, of that. And I don't know if that's just a licensing issue or, or what. But Well, it will be interesting to track that over time. Because yeah. you go to Disney every other year as an adult? Is that a, yeah, a safe? I mean, Disney's every, your happy place. Disney is where, right? Every two or three years, yeah, we try and yeah. get down there depending. You need to have enough rotation of new rides and things coming in that kind of make it feel new again. Worth a while, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That that is interesting. Um, more to say on that, or should I keep it moving? No, I think that's a, that's it. I it, a little bit of a teaser, but I I think that there is a a trend of some of the mass market stuff being pulled back away yeah. from hobby level games, and I'm just kind of hypothesizing that uh, uh, casual gamers were bringing some of these games home and not being able to play them because they are not familiar enough with gaming mechanisms. I could be wrong on that, but... That... Well, Board Game Twitter says that you're right. Uh, okay. In the last <laughs> few weeks, there uh, and the only reason why I'm saying that, I, I uh, there's a designer, I think I think it was Jeffrey Allers, and I don't want to get that wrong, but I believe the guy that designed New York Slice yeah. Um, yeah. put out a, a post very recently just saying, like, what happened to all the, the diversity of games in my big box stores? Look what it's yeah. back to. Um, so that, I think that is a school of gaming segment that we can definitely talk about and reflect on. Was it just a moment in time in 2020 and 2021 where those games flooded hobby level and light hobby yeah. and, and tons of different family games, the big box stores, or is it, you know, something else? So that's, yeah. that's interesting that you saw that at Disney um, yeah. right now while other folks are talking about it as well. So, what have you played, Michael? What what what's yeah, so been I getting got, played in your house? I got th well because I played the, nothing. The usuals have been coming up, so we've yeah. still been playing a ton of trio. Llama has gotten played with multiple game groups. I had some family time over the weekend. Don't need to talk to our listeners about those. Um, but I did get three new games to the table, and one was on board game arena, and I played an asynchronous game of it before but i knew that i played it wrong and so with um with one of our friends and our friend's dad we played the game malem by the good dr reiner knizia i'm sorry did you say phlegm 
M L E M Melem. Okay. And phlegm will probably be what the good doctor rebrands <laughs> yeah, re it as in 2027. So, yeah, yeah. When it's a, a lung expectorant theme. But this is the cats in space where you're kind of, you, you get a cat astronaut. And um, basically, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk to you in shorthand and then some of our listeners will know. It's a lot like Celestia, but you have astronauts that have an ability um, and you get to decide if you're going to put them on a moon or send them into deep space. Little press your luck uh, game that, you know, had a lot of buzz when it first came out about this time last year. And then right after Essen ish, or maybe it was even early 2024, that buzz died down. And, and I'm, I'm seeing it on a lot of trade lists. Hmm. So I thought, yeah, I'll give this one a try, especially since I knew the other two folks had played it and knew the rules really well. So I knew I could yeah. ask questions. And um, boy, I had a ton of fun. It's it's one that I'm going to want to try to get to the table with you and with a couple other folks that I know that love Press Your Luck Dice games. Uh -huh. um, I don't know how much of a game is there. I don't know how replayable it is, this or that. But at some point in yeah. time, I, I might try to snag a copy and trade or in a... You, you know how those things happen. Yeah. Um, but that, that was one that's... I'm, I'm glad I got to play it on Board Game Arena with people who knew the rules and we talked it through and, and played it twice. And it is one that I now want to play in person. Um, so that's that was that was fun. That's an unfortunate name. And I'm, I'm looking it? at... I'm looking at the board game geek just to see, like, okay, what's your uh, acronym on here of what? And like, there's nothing listed, and it's, it's so it's not like a good one. Mlem Space Agency, interesting. Yeah, the cool thing though, your your astronauts that you're putting in the ship that have an ability, if it crashes, you get them back. But if they jump off, uh, which thematically, the only way that that the good doctor makes it make sense is that cats get nine lives, right? Um, so you get that cat back. But if you park them on a moon or on a planet, they're gone and they're out of the game. So there was at least one occasion where I was like, oh, I, I need this cat to get to deep space. So I was rooting for a crash. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Um, the other thing that happens if the person leading the ship decides to jump out onto a planet or onto a moon. So if they're done, then it goes to the next person in line to take command of the ship. Mm. So I, it was it it really had some feeling of of Celestia, a game that was a game of the week for us a while back, sure. a game that both of us love, but with added abilities and kind of some added things, and it ran ran quickly too. It was fun. Yeah, artwork looks cool. Yeah, artwork is awesome. And then I have two others. Um, so do you have access to your text messages at the moment? I do not. I well, I've okay. got I, okay. I got some pictures from you that I can you, access on my watch. Okay. okay. Looks like you've been well, doing that, arts that, and crafts. Just, yes. So the I was really excited because <laughs> I was no, going to get to play. It's all good Michael McCabe story start. <laughs> yeah. I was really excited. I, now, the, now I know the wheels are coming off at some point. Get into it. I was, and I had planned this. You know, I had, I, 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 when I knew you were going to be gone for a week and I could see, okay, Thursday is a day. I'm going to get a hobby level game played, a game that Doug may not enjoy. I'm going to take a risk. And I sent like a half dozen different games to our friend, right? Yeah. And he, we settled on one called Teletum or Tiletum, mm -hmm. which is a beautiful mid to heavyweight Euro by Simone Luciani and Daniel Tashini, you know, and I'm like, mm -hmm. board and dice published. I was like, I am really excited to get into this. And I knew that our, our buddy was coming over around 830 because he's got to put his kids to bed. So I told the whole family, hey, at 730, I'm going downstairs because I have to learn this game. I thought in an hour, I can learn the game. I can, I can <laughs> get far enough in in an hour. Yeah, I know it's a 3.43, but the guy that's coming over is... Um, I don't want to say Rain Man ask with a rule book, but like really, really good with a rule book, what right? And could could he's an engineer, him, yeah, <laughs> and a product engineer, and designs inserts for board games and all that. So I'm feeling good about it. I actually roll down to the basement five minutes early, and I take off the cover of the box, Doug. And this was a game that I recently picked up at Noble Knight. Had some nice store credit, cashed it in for a little game that I wanted to try. 
Um, simply because I knew there were a lot of bits inside the box. And it's one of those in trade. I don't want to get it with a, you know, I, I, I got it in Obelion. It looked good. I thought it was a sweet deal. And the entire game has approximately 500 different tiles <laughs> and pieces in it. There's wood pieces. There's plastic pillars. There's 20 dice. There is a ton of cardboard chits and punch outs, and all of them were put into this bag and the bags inside this bag. And for folks who are listening, this is about a one gallon size Ziploc bag that was just filled to the brim. And I had. There's enough bags there for school lunches for the entire year. I just had this overwhelming feeling of dread. Yeah. (laughs) And I was just like. Okay, what do I even have here? <laughs> Go to work. And I got the rule book open to page one and just started sorting into piles. Not knowing what any of the rules were. Not having watched <laughs> any of the videos. I, I listened to some reviews in 2021 and 2022 when this thing came out. But for the next hour, all I did was sort. I did not set up. I did not do anything. And my lead into this is if you look at the second picture, and mm-hmm. I will put both of these on our X account on Friday. As soon as the episode posts over lunch or in the afternoon, I could probably automate it. I'll, I'll put a side-by-side picture so you can see the bag with the bits in it, and then you could see the folded space insert that yeah. now resides inside, and it's just, it's just beautiful. It, it brings me joy. So all that to say, to the good folks at Folded Space, this game would not have stayed in my collection. So you've kept a game <laughs> in my collection because I'm able to sort it and play it. Well, you must but have enjoyed it to invest I in did. folded space. I, I did. I did. I did. Thank you. That's where I was going. I was back at Noble Knight this past Monday, and they just happened to have a folded space sitting there. I was like, I'll take that home. Thank you, uh, because I don't appreciate how you sold me that game the last time, but I digress. <laughs> Maybe I should keep that personal. But in Tealtum, what's what's cool about it, the dice are... Uh, triggering abilities and resources. So it's a a dice drafting mechanism that you kind of have three different things that you're going to be able to do. You can fill your house with people, with workers, with craftsmen and women, right? Or you can go out and try to get contracts or you can build um, in, in in one of the various cities. But the movement is really tight. You can't just move around this board and go wherever you want to go. So it's one of those where it's not just that you want to make one decision. It's that in a 60-minute game, because it's only played over four rounds, you very quickly realize there's about 10 things I'm not going to be able to do. What is the best thing that I can do on my turn? And if you stack Mm -hmm. those things time after time after time, um, eventually you're going to have a pretty pretty good game. Um, I, I... I'm keeping it. I mean, it's one that I really like. The The solo version looks awesome, and I think I got the rules down enough now um, to at least be able to get to the table in the next year or so. So colors that was one that... Colors were good for you? What's that? Colors were awful. Colors were absolutely okay. awful. <laughs> Cannot tell the gray from the pink. I'm looking don't at pictures know, now. Just don't to... know what the coal is, um, <laughs> but with one Sharpie marker and then a little trick of putting the dice into the... Because there's unless you're playing with all four people, there's extra dice. Mm. So whatever leftover dice is just sits in the bits. So I can look and see like, okay, that's that's yeah. the cotton, that's the stone. So yeah, there's five different resources as well that when you take a dice off, you're going, going to get that number of the resources. And then there's an action number that's tied to it as well. So maybe if I take the gold dice off, I'm going to get gold. And then maybe the worker action that's tied to that is contracts. Uh, So maybe I'm getting six gold, but then I only get three of the contract actions. So it's that decision that um, when I I had huge concerns about slowdown and analysis Mm -hmm. paralysis, but things moved really quickly. Um, And it was fun. I like what Daniel Tashini and Simone Luciani do in, in some of their games. Yeah. Um, and this was one that I, I really did enjoy. The colors, a big barrier for me. I, I don't need to go too too deep into that. And I think, you know, one Sharpie marker um, 
and and a couple of stickers that would solve it for me and my house. But a, l- yeah. a lot of fun, really, well, really interesting decisions, and plays in an hour once you actually know the rules. It's twenty twenty five minutes per person. Yeah, what's interesting about that one is um, just the I'm looking kind of at the board game geek stuff while you're chatting there, and mm-hmm. um, just looking here. I, what's interesting about those designers and uh, Simone Luciani and I guess both of them is it's a uh, for me personally it's a situation where I enjoy um, Voyages of Marco Polo and absolutely and I, I enjoy like Newton but then like Darwin's Journey and even looking at Tiltum and Grand Austria Hotel and Lorenzo Il Magnifico, they all seem very similar to me that it always feels like I kind of have that base covered. And I don't know and if I, that's... I get that. I have it, that with other designers. I if absolutely If that's accurate do. or not, but it's like um, I, I, I had a copy of Lorenzo Il Magnifico or I still do. I'm waiting to sell it, but I I opened it up and I looked at it and I'm like, yeah, it's kind of doing the artwork and everything just kind of looks kind of like Newton and does some of the same stuff. And I only have so much mental capacity for that level weight of, of game where it's loosely tied to a theme, but not really. And it, so it's very interesting designer because I do love Voyages of Marco Polo, but yep. some of the other ones are just... Uh, too samey to me, even if they're not. I'm, I'm sure there are people that are huge fans of, of them that could say, well, these are all the differences. Like, I get it. It's more of just a feeling. Um, no, and that's where... Yeah, have your feelings, Doug. Yeah. Rock, rock your feelings. I completely get where you're coming <laughs> from. Um, I like what that design team does with movement, uh, mm. with dice, and with resource allocation. And yeah. in each of those games, like I don't own Voyages of Marco Polo because it's on Board Game Arena and you own it. So that's one that I've kind of come to the conclusion of. I don't really need to own it. Yeah. I love Darwin's Journey and I like Teletum, but I've, I can't bring them out with everybody. You yeah. Know? So it's, it's a year from now, I'll probably only own one of those two. You know, yeah. it'll be yeah. whichever one plays better solo that I think I can get to the table easier. So sure. yeah, I think that that feeling is um, I, I have that with other designers always. It's like, no, nah, I have enough of their games. Uh, I'll play yeah. it, but I don't need to own it. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's one of those the hotness, man. When this thing came out, it was right after Darwin's Journey and Essen, and you couldn't get it in North America. And you know, if you just wait, um, it'll eventually be a Noble Knight on clearance. And, yeah, yeah there or you go. get it in a trade. I've got one more. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, go ahead. All right. No, you go. I was going to send it back to you. Well, the only thing I've got is a a little bit of awesomeness in gaming, which is the Marvel United Multiverse Kickstarter pledge arrived. Hey, tell us about it, Doug. I'm excited about that. Well, that is. uh, I guess I can summarize it in in this phrase from my daughter when I opened the box, which was, don't you already have that game? (laughs) Doug. And, (laughs) And I proceeded to say, Yes, and this is more of it, and there's more coming still, um, but I'm pretty excited about it, so that's it. It was exciting for me. Nothing more really to ex- to share, but it's not not as frequently as it used to be that a, a new game comes in, and I'm, I'm excited. I guess maybe that's the rarity of it is... There's games coming out and in, and we're playing games and getting stuff to the table. And um, it's not as special and momentous as it used to be. Of like, oh, I got this new order come in. I, I can't wait to open it up and check it out. And um, sometimes there are a few rare Kickstarter games and things like that that still give me that um, that feeling, which I guess is more of a sad state on my account than it is. Uh, the hobby as a whole. Uh, it's just where we're at in the hobby and, and 185 episodes into a podcast where we have a weekly show. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We, we need to play two to three games a week, and at least one of those games for each of us needs to be a new game. Otherwise, yeah. we're not going to be able to make shows. <laughs> and I think yes. th- there are some externalities with that. You know, the, some of the unintended consequences are that you maybe can enjoy a Kickstarter when you get it and just dive into that for the next 10 to 15 days. No, I think... Yeah. 
I, I'm glad it came. Um, did did you? Were you worried about porch pirates or anything? Did it come while you were on vacation or no? Uh, it arrived. Well, and... I've I've got a very friendly neighbor Good. who happened to sire me that um, <laughs> <laughs> that that looks in on my house uh, while I am on vacation. So having or your uh, father could just come over and help out too, right? Well, him too. Yeah, that, okay. that, that would be the the man. Okay. Um, so. So that works out well. We we kind of scratch cool. each other's backs when we're on vacation and and pick up mail and, and take out garbage and do all of those type of things. And nice make to have sure awesome awkward. parents nearby, isn't it? Yeah, make sure yeah. awkward lights aren't on when they shouldn't be. So things good. like that. Awesome. Well, I'm gonna have to invite myself over for a game day here soon so I can see it. That's good. That's yeah. good. Yeah. So I've got one more, Doug. I did get uh, Honey Buzz Fall Flavor to the table. Sure. Um, Played that last Thursday. You know, we, we've kind of talked around it. And I, I I don't like listening to a podcast when people refer to someone as like in their game group. But we and we've we've interviewed this person before. Dan Cunningham actually designed the insert for he Paul is in Flavors. Our game group. He is in our game group. Yes, <laughs> yeah. but he's not like a co host on the show. Yeah. You know what I mean? So to our, and he's not on our Discord. Shame on you, Dan. You should invest in our Discord a little bit and come meet the awesome Game Schooler podcast group. Anyways, um, we this is not a review. I'm just kind of talking to my friend Doug about my initial take on the expansion. I may be talking about it later in the show. Teaser. Oh, it's but, essential. Um, there's six different modules in the box. We played with the Fall Fruit module which all that it does, um, it allows you to sell fruit to the market. And then what, what I loved about it, it does what I think really good expansions do. It adds more stuff and gives just slightly more decisions without slowing the game down. So in the fall fruit module, and I jumped right into Honey Buzz. I guess I should have, um, <laughs> I jumped right into the, the expansion. Let me just tell our listeners Honey Buzz was a game of the week all the way back in episode 82, if you believe that or not, two years ago, Douglas. Almost 100 um, episodes. Yeah. Uh, it, more than 100, Doug. 103 episodes ago. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, so in, in the Fall Flavors module, you're selling fruit of the market. And when you sell a full set of three, uh, so the pumpkin, the apple, and the pear is what we were playing with, uh, you get another little bonus, and then the price drops. And, and so it... it a lot of the same mechanics, but just used in different way with some added features. The other module that we played with that the designer has said on Board Game Geek, everybody should play with, including in the base game. And that is, uh, there's a nice little stall there, Sweetwater Sunset. And all it is is this added little board where you put one of the beautiful little bees on it. And then that when certain things happen in the game, it works as a timer and it counts down towards the end. So maybe the first time somebody buys out all the contracts of one pile, boom, it's jumping down two in a two-player game. Maybe the, the first time somebody gets all types of a tile, boom, it's jumping down. So I didn't get into the other modules. I didn't do anything solo with it because, I, frankly, I want to play those with you. Yeah. You know, it's a game that um, I got to tell you, I know I was a game of the week back in 82 with us. And the, uh, it, it, this is just an incredible game. I was really mm. glad to get it back to the table. I'm impressed with what the expansion adds. Uh, and, and then there's little things. I, I like the new board. I mean, it's a nice little fall, uh, fall themed board. Um, so that I'll be very interested to hear your take on it. I'm going to be bringing this box over to you next time I see you. So you can just kind of check it out at your own pace. You know, the yeah. nice little pieces with the pumpkins and the pears and the, the apples, kind of what you would expect from Elf Creek and what we have yeah. talked about in Santa's Workshop and other games that they've done. So just wanted to share that with you. I'm not going to say a whole lot more about it other than I had a ton of fun. I played really well. I was doing awesome, but I didn't end the game at the right time. So then you know what happened based on the person that I was playing with. The you MIT got grad away. got that extra turn <laughs> and just put on like 47 points in his last turn. So if you could have ended it one turn sooner, Michael, I was trying. I was trying, <laughs> Dan. <laughs> uh, but fun little game and, and, and one that I, I think is worth exploring more for both yeah. of us. So, Okay, cool. 
Uh, and if you are not watching this on YouTube, go check out this episode. Michael's got lots of visual aids on this this one that you can see live and in person. He's showing bits to cameras, uh, boxes and components, coffee mug, tea, apparently, I'm assuming. Tea this time of day. No coffee. <laughs> so... Uh, anything else, Michael, before we do a little bit gentle housekeeping and move on? Yeah, the only thing, I think we do need to reach out to Folded Space, maybe get like a first real deal sponsor. I don't know what they want to give us, if it's 10000 20000 40000 store credit for life. But yeah. I'll just tell you, while you were gone and I didn't have my friend <laughs> Doug to talk to, I put together five Folded <laughs> so Spaces, bored. Doug. He's so bored. He's got to do arts five. and crafts. It, well, you know, my oldest is knitting on the couch upstairs. Uh, kids are playing, and I'm I'm gluing together tapestry. I'm gluing together autobahn. I'm gluing together tealatum. I'm gluing, my, my, gluing together lacrimosa. <laughs> Michael was I making in, Michael was making inserts for games he doesn't even own. And like, I, I just no, need some inserts. No, that was to last build. year. That was, <laughs> that last, was year. last year. No, that was last year when you were on vacation. This year it was just the ones that I I I'm, it's I now when Doug goes on vacation, that's the week when I build my inserts. Yeah, so, the, we'll have to reach out. Cozy crafting time turns into a little creature comforts animal and just gets to work um we talked about that earlier in the episode but check out our discord gameschooler.com slash discord it's a great community that combines the convenience of a text message with the threads of a forum and a great community there so check that out if you do like what we're, what we're doing please spread the word about the podcast don't uh just randomly come up to Michael in the gym and, and drop. No, him. do that. That's awesome. That's the best, <laughs> Doug. We we had it happen at one time when we were playing games. Somebody yeah. came up and just no. said, "Hey, really like the show, guys." That please keep no, doing I that. No, I do. Lo- I do love that. No, I just meant keep telling other people so that <laughs> that keeps happening. Um, let us know that you're listening. How about that? Let us know that you're listening and you appreciate what we're doing because we appreciate that and keeps us going. Uh, there's not a lot of money in the podcast business in case, in case you haven't noticed. Um, there's Joe Rogan and everybody else. Yeah. Uh, contact us with questions or comments. Email at gameschooler.com. We would love to hear from you. With that out of the way, let's move on to the game of the week. The game of the week. Oh, yeah. The game of the <laughs> week is an in depth look at a family friendly game we think you should try if you get the chance. This week's game is Draft and Write Records, baby. Doug, give us the stats. Snap into a Slim Jim. <laughs> Draft and Write Records, published in 2024 by Inside Up Games. The designer is Bruno Messiel, and the art is by Pedro A. Alberto. One to six players, 30 to 60 minutes. I would say probably 45 is going to be that sweet spot. Uh, 10 plus uh, on the, the box. 12 plus from Board Game Geek, and I'm probably going to lean towards that 12 plus. And I think this is going to fall in a light hobby game. And I think it's one of those that, uh, and Michael may dispute me on this, but I think it seems easier for gamers because we're familiar with roll and write games. I agree with you 100%. Yeah. I thought you were going to dispute me on it, but we're, we're simpatico, locked in, same wavelength. Go get yeah. it, Doug. So it's a, it's a roll and write or a draft and write game. <laughs> it's in the, uh, the title. But it, it is one where I think when you're used to those mechanisms, the same way that a trick-taking game, if you're familiar with that, it has a lot of a shorthand. Um, in draft and write records, players draft cards simultaneously to take actions in hope of hitting the big time. Strategically recruit crew members to your band to create harmony, triggering bonus actions such as going on tour or releasing albums. Complete goals to earn extra star power and outperform the competition. Basically, the game is divided into a week and a weekend phase. In the week phase, you take turns drafting cards and then filling in corresponding areas on your player sheet. For example, selecting a bus will allow you to track or uh, Track mark off the the next space of the branching world tour section, uh, scoring points for how far you go. So there are a couple of different roads you can go down, and you're just going to mark off the next one every time you take a bus. 
the uh, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my place here. No, you're good. Uh, you can also release albums and singles. And you'll score points at the end of the game by multiplying the number of singles by the number of albums you've created. You can add crews such as a lead singer, musicians, production staff, and backstage sta- staff, allowing you to score points and activate harmonies by matching s- crew skills. Each crew member or band member will have a uh, little um, square or a God, what, what's the word? cross, a cross of... Um, four different colors in north south east west and you are trying to connect colors to other band members so for example if i have a musician with a yellow on the right side if i can get a band member next to him with a yellow on the left side and those two connect you create a harmony Uh, harmonies assets and agendas are all kind of grid based bonuses so if you fill in a complete column or if you fill in two next to them you can take the bonus in between um, they, uh, they give you those type of bonus points. If you can't play a card, you draft, or you draft a scandal card, you need to cross off a fail, which will cost you points at the end of the game. And during the weekend phase, you can claim personal and public goal cards for points and bonuses. The game ends when a player claims their sixth goal card or checks off all five fail spaces or fills all 12 crew members. The players then check to see how many crew members they're missing and check off one space in their fail section for each missing band member. The player with the most points wins. So kind of hard. I don't know if it's tricky to kind of describe a, a roll and write or in this case a draft yeah. and write in it, which it, you're it, selecting a card and then marking off something on your board based on the card that you picked. Yeah, it's really difficult to describe a game where everything is so essential to the actual board itself. And so if you have the ability, if you're not driving, if you're not flying a plane at the moment, if you have the ability to just (laughs) pause, look up draft and write records and actually look at the board. Thank you for rejoining us. Yeah. Um, Personal player board. The personal player board is incredible. And I, I know we're going to say a lot about it, but I really think the, the brilliance of the game is in the one board that you are playing on. A lot of roll and rights or flip and rights, wh- whether they're designed by the good Dr. Reiner Knizia or Matthew Dunson and Brett J. Gilbert, they, they have multiple maps, multiple player boards, multiple different locations you can play on. And what Draft and Write Records did they designed one board that is so tightly integrated together that you can play this game over and over and over and over. And even though you get really used to the cards and the crew members and how different things sync up, you're not going to have the same two games. Yeah, uh, This is one that we re- first played on July 10th. And today in real time, it's August 28th. So over the last six weeks, We've played this game with different people. We've played this game together. We've played this game in person. I've played this game on Board Game Arena a lot. And no two games are similar. That being said, it's kind of hard to describe and just give an overview of of the mechanics without just diving into the theme. You're trying to build a band, get that band to travel, get the best crewmates to synergize and harmonize and then you get to make decisions along the way about well are you gonna release an album or are you gonna go heavy on towards cassettes do you really want to travel the entire map um just just an awesome game they're right there in about 30 or 40 minutes yeah i think one of the things i really like about this which is i don't know if i've played one like that and and if you're unfamiliar with a roll and write as a it's kind of a catch-all name which is started with the idea of you roll a die and and the dice that come up those are the the options that you have of marking on on your board your personal player board so maybe a two comes up oh okay i can write a two in in this spot or something along those lines it's kind of become a a catch-all for any type of game where you're marking stuff with paper and pencil or markers and and then erasing it and getting rid of that that sheet at the end of the game what i like about this one and you mentioned it that no two games are, are alike. One of the things that does that is because it's drafting instead of just selecting. So 
in a game like Welcome 2 where you flip over three cards or three sets of cards and then everybody has all the same options, a lot of those games feel like the first two or three rounds always play out the exact same or everybody's yep. taking the same option. And so three rounds in, Michael and I can look across the board and we have the exact same uh, spots marked off with the exact same numbers. And then eventually... And we're both going after the same objective, so we have to yeah. figure out who can get there first so we don't split the points. Yeah, and ultimately in all of those games, eventually you you know, diverge from one another However, in this one, because you're drafting instead of, okay, here are your options, like you're taking that, that, that choice, that card, and I'm doing that. Michael yeah. can no longer do that. I'm taking that lead singer. I'm taking that guitar player. Michael can't get that guitar player anymore. And so right from the very first turn, we are on divergent paths going and playing this game. And that is what makes it really unique to me. And not only is it a draft and pass draft play and pass game it it plays one to six players folks so that's why you're going to get a very different feel if you're playing this solo by yourself in the living room while a whole lot of other things are going on you're still going to have a fun game then if you play it with two players once you get to four players you're only going to see those cards one more time you're only going to see one of those cards for a second time and so i i just think that the game there's there's layers to this game um, that I haven't found in other, and I, I love flip and write. I, I love yeah. games that involve drafting. I love roll and write. I, I've, I've shared openly on this show in the last few months that my house is full of them. Like I, once we played draft and write records in July, I, I sent a handful of games into noble night because I knew yeah. like, okay, this is one that I'm going to want to have sitting in my collection here. So which ones need to go because of how it combines what you're talking about, the drafting with making the decision and what am I going to connect? Uh, and and the, there's a thematic element that yeah. others may push back on. You know, I could hear other reviewers no. maybe saying, oh, the theme's paced. And the, no, 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 no. I really feel like, well, yeah. I, I've got to get my band going here, you know, and yeah. and. Let's talk a little bit, too, about how money works, because I think well, that's so fascinating. I don't know if you have it further down your sheet or where you had it or no, what you I, want to talk about. Well, it's about funny because it. I actually have on my list the, the, that it works thematically well for a roll and write game, which are usually pretty themeless. And if they do have a theme, they somewhat feel pasted on, and it's more about numbers than it is on that. This game has good tie-ins of oh okay i can understand that touring i can understand that i'm adding these musicians one of the things that we haven't talked about which i have number one on my list is the idea of cash so certain things that you will do will unlock bonus cash and you need to spend that cash to unlock parts of your player board so there are certain musicians that you cannot hire until you pay cash and unlock those. There are certain venues and locations that you cannot go to unless you have cash to drive there. And managing that, and there are times in the game where you will get a card and you're like, ah, this is the perfect musician to add, and it's going to give me so many bonus actions and synergies and, and harmony and I don't have that space unlocked because I because haven't paid Because you cash. spent the cash to open up a part on the road that you yeah. thought you would be going to next turn. However, yeah. you don't know what's coming next turn because the cards haven't been passed to you yet. So there's that sense of, oh, if only I had put the money somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. And, so you're, and then the other thing, too, is if you're chasing cash you're missing out on other bonuses that you can do. And I think the, the, the bonuses work really well together and they have great iconography. So yep. if, if there is a circle, that is a kind of a main action. And if it's a diamond, it's a bonus action. So seeing that iconography on the cards and on the boards, like, oh, okay, this is a bonus tour action because it's got a bus, but that bus is in a diamond instead of a circle. And that works really well compared to what is somewhat complex and busy on the board is is pretty easy to pick up. Yeah. All things considered, right? That yeah. iconography is really well done for... It's solid. 
You know, yeah, a, a game that's got a lot going on. You don't need to consult the rule. This is not a game where you're like, what does this do exactly again? Yeah. You're, you're pretty good once you get going. And I'll say this, the Board Game Arena adaptation, whoever created that, it's phenomenal. If, you're tr- if you just want to learn the game uh, and, and kind of a try before you buy, it's really good because you can undo your choices and it has a little timer. So you have like nine seconds of, oh, if I put it here versus if I put it there, if I put it over there. And so you can almost test out what some of those potential bonuses would be. Uh, and I enjoyed that after I'd played the game, you know, a handful of times in person with you. Yeah. I enjoyed going into the board game arena atmosphere and there, and this was in the month of July and early August. People were still really good on it. Um, so I, I wanted to share that. The other thing though, about the bonuses, and I really like this, it's going to sound like I'm about to complain, but this is something that I actually have grown to love in games. I love when the bonuses synergize, and then I love playing two or three games later, and none of the bonuses click. Mm. And some of it is because of me, and some of it is because of random chance. I've grown to almost have a a taste of like, uh, when, uh, you know, if everybody has bonuses on every turn in every game, yeah. Um, to me, that doesn't make me feel like I'm doing much as a gamer. So I'm just going to read for you the first three games, the scores that were logged. These were the first th- first three get- times that Doug and I had played this game two-player. All right. Game one, 158, me. Doug, 151. Pretty solid when you look at game two later that night. Me, 97. Doug, 95. Well, folks, for the next seven days, Doug just must have (laughs) stewed on it and thought about what he could do better because the same two people came back one week later. Doug, 212 (laughs) to my 99. I still don't feel like I had a bad game, but I... And it was after that game where I I got more than doubled up. You know, just completely humbled, almost like a bad round of golf or a bad day of shooting on the basketball court where it's like, yeah, I want to go back and play. I, I like, I'd like to keep playing this game. I want to see what's going on here. Uh, and I've had that same experience on Board Game Arena as well, where, you know, you have a game and everything clicks and you're getting the bonuses. And then the next game, it's just like, oh, I put my money on the road and I should have put it into my crew and I don't have any of my harmony synergized. Like, oh, oh, oh. So I, I actually really like that and have that as a positive for, for draft and write that you have, you'll have some good games and you'll have some, some games where things just don't work out in your favor. Well, and it's hard to do everything. That's to me, one of the, the hallmarks is that I love the bonus structure. I love the way that all of that works together. However, every time I'm playing the game, even the game that I got 212 points, I still felt like, oh, I'm kind of neglecting this area. Or I wish I could get more bonuses over here, you know? And that, to Doug, me, is you a bowled sign. a 300 that game, all right? I don't I know. know how many more sports analogies. Like, I would love to see you put up 213. You, you play it, draft and write every day for the rest of 2024. Find another human out there. Play two-player and tell me when you hit 213 <laughs> because I don't think you'll hit 212 again, man. That, that was a game so where either. everything I, was falling. Like, like what were you had different Seinfeld and Simpson mutterings that you were saying? Everything's coming up. Millhouse. There were like every single turn you're <laughs> ranting as you're just connecting these chains. Uh, whereas it, one of the games before you and I had played, you're like, oh gosh, Michael, I feel like you're getting combinations on every turn. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's the thing is it's it, even when you're doing well, it feels like you could be doing more. Yeah. And even when you're doing poorly. You're still getting bonuses and things are feeling kind of good, right? You're still I mean, working hard for the band. You're still yeah. trying to get the band <laughs> out there. <laughs> so I, I think that's cool. One of the things that we haven't talked about is the game comes with colored pencils and um, and regular pencils to to mark off your score sheets and the those band harmonies when you connect those uh, crew members together. Uh, they work good. Uh, I found them to be a little light that I couldn't really keep track of what I was doing. In the meantime, I have laminated my sheets 
and gotten color dry erase markers to um, make it easier for me to see when I'm crossing things off and making those connections. I don't think it's a necessity, but I have enjoyed it more since I've done that as more of a um, uh, ease of play type of thing as opposed to uh, a necessity of, of gameplay. Yeah, and I love that you do that. That's one of the things, if I'm playing a game at your house, I appreciate that you've laminated it and you have dry erase marker, and I really do. I'm just a little bit more caveman in my approach where I play roll and writes with pens. There's not many things I do in my life with pencils, so I'm a pen and Sharpie guy on it, and that's just my style. Um, but the colored pencils, I think that they're functional, but like Doug yeah. said, they they it's... It is light, especially if you're taking that into the community, into the schoolhouse. I can see how some of those things might not hold up over time. The price point on this game is sweet. Um, There's a lot of game, and this is something we don't talk about as much as we did when we first started the show, but there's a lot of game for $30, you know, and I'm seeing this thing like today, real time miniature market, $25.99. Um, board game bliss, $32 Canadian. So what's that like $12 us, <laughs> uh, Amazon 31 99. It's just, and we saw it at Gen Con. I think it was, what was yeah. it? 25 bucks cash or something. So a lot of game, um, for, for under $30 there. And I think the production's pretty solid, but I'm, if it's a roll and write, I'm always not always, I'm usually going to use my own things. Yeah. And you are too. Uh, I guess that's kind of what where we're landing at. I wonder how yeah. normal that is for gamers in general. I don't. I love the idea of. I guess it depends on on the game. Like this one, I feel like there's so much, um, kind of keeping track of bonus and moving on and stuff like that, where it's easy to put something in the wrong spot or 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 mark something and be like, nah, maybe I shouldn't do that. Compared to something like Welcome to like. Yeah, once I put the three done down, I'm fine. I'm never moving. I'm never looking back where this one has a little bit more strategy would be my only thing that would keep me from I, I, using a pen, that kind of permanence and just jacking up my whole sheet um, is would, would be more dependent on the game. Like I said, there's a lot of yeah. roll and writes where I would be able to use a pen and, and prefer a pen over a pencil just because it's easier darker to read and and i don't feel like i'm second guessing myself this is one right. where it's like all right i can i have you know sometimes it's like based on where i put this i have the option of three different bonuses i could take and trying to kind of think about that although i don't feel like the game slows down very much no Do you? no no because of the the drafting playing and passing no um and the interaction is in what cards other people are taking and i think there's two other things that we need to talk about we haven't really talked about the weekend phase like we probably should and then we probably need to talk about some of those negative points where if you are unable to play i think we're telling the story of the game we should cover those two things while we get into our skills a little bit um in those the, both of those two areas i don't know if you want to talk about the weekend or talk about you yeah know. well I, I mentioned in the opening that the the weekend is where you can claim goal cards so there are what four or five goal cards out per round is that yeah correct? it depends on player count yeah um and if you happen to complete the goal in the the previous week you can claim that card or claim the points and get whatever bonus is. And, and if two people complete it in the same round, they both get the bonus. So there's a little bit of a race there uh, to try and complete it or at least match it in the same round as somebody else. Um, and if you get a card that gets passed to you that you cannot play, you need to mark off a, a fail. And if you get five of those, the game is going to end. But for each fail, you are going to increase the amount of negative points you get at the end of the game. And the yeah. same same thing. If you get five happens, of those, it, you're you're an automatic loser. It's not just that it's a fail. You're done. Are you sure? I'm pretty sure. If I'll you look. if you fill in your fifth, I it, think it just triggers the end of the game. Okay. Well, and then minus, maybe the negative twenty points makes you yeah. a loser, which yeah, is definitely uh, it's happened to me before. I've been yeah. that loser. I've been on both yeah, ends. Yeah. There's of this. a 
There's I haven't an ever scored 212. I mean, no, I've been in the high no. 170s myself. <laughs> um, there, there's an exclamation point after the fail and the goal card on the scoring sheets because those indicate if you fill up all of those, it's a trigger for the end okay. of the game. Must have just been the initial teach that I received back on July 10th. Yeah, probably um, some idiot taught you that game. <laughs> a brilliant guy, brilliant guy. But the other thing that I I like about some of the, the choice of, okay, I'm going to take a negative two points here because I don't want to place this card. I could place this card as my lead singer, but I know that there's a better one coming, so I'm going to take the negative two here. And, and so you have that choice to sometimes take the negative points. And the second time that you take, uh, that you fill in one of those circles, you actually get a dollar. Uh, so a l slight little catch up mechanism. Um, so there are just a lot of really good things happening in the game. Yeah, I think, you know, as far as skills are concerned, one of the things I really like about this is the, the drafting and the, the playing combine two different skills in a way that really works for me because while i'm drafting it allows me to focus on what's good for me and observe what other players are doing in the same way that a lot of drafting games do as i can see what michael's trying to collect or i can see that he doesn't have space to play any of these mu musicians so i'm going to send those over to him and maybe not take one um so I like that you can observe what the other people are doing and then make that decision and fill in your own board, which then leads to kind of that tactical thinking of how am I going to use these bonuses? Where am I going to, where am I going to place this to trigger more bonuses? And, and they can cascade and escalate off of one another as you're playing is just a nice uh, dichotomy of being able to have both of those where a lot of times I'm in a game and it's, okay, what am I doing? And other times you're playing games where it's like, what's everybody else doing? And this game does a good job, I think, of combining both of those. Yeah, and I think the, the problem solving uh, that happens too, especially mid-game of trying to figure out how to get further down the road towards an objective that you're getting or actually um, get different crew members, uh, band members in, into your band, um, is, is an awesome skill that comes out through repeated plays as you get more familiar with the cards and with the objectives and how the different pieces bounce off of each other on the board. It's kind of, um, a sense of, okay, I think I know how I want to approach this problem. It's a different type of problem solving. It's almost like a, an ongoing of, I'm just going to grind on this and, and, and churn through a little bit. And that's how I'll solve that problem. Uh, in a way that I haven't found in many of the, the light hobby games or family games that we've reviewed. I actually also really enjoy the competition in this game. Mm -hmm. uh, we define competition as a game that develops healthy competitive habits as two or more parties compete for a goal or reward that isn't shared. Um, I've, I, I think the interaction in person is unparalleled for a game like this compared to board game arena. Right. Yeah. Um, it, but even, you know, I haven't, I'm going to get real deep here into some personal life stuff. I did like a 30 hour cook over the summer. All right. Where I, I cooked for 30 hours straight, getting ready for a family reunion, uh, cook some pork shoulders and cooked a brisket, uh, for probably 18 of those hours, I was playing draft and write on board game <laughs> arena. Like I played so <laughs> different player counts, solo in the middle of the night, two players, six players. I was just game hopping. And um, I was impressed with it. I, 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 was, I, I was really, uh, and this was after we'd already played it a handful of times. Um, there was a different type of competitiveness. It wasn't of, oh, I want to get first. It was at the end of the game, I could see decisions that other players had made. And I was interested by it. It's like, yeah. huh. So that's that's when you went ahead and really filled in your harmonies, you know? Um, so there's a lot there. I got on a rant a little bit, but I guess if you spend 18 <laughs> hours over 30 hours playing one game, uh, rants will happen. In a meat coma. Um, I wasn't. Is, I was just cooking. 
<laughs> one of the things that I really enjoy on this game, and I think it's a skill that uh, I wish got highlighted more, and I think it's a really valuable skill, especially for younger players and just a, a great life skill, and that's personal responsibility, which is a game that highlights the cause and effect nature of players' actions and the related result. This game, when you have that, and we talked about it earlier, when you have that opportunity to draft that musician, but then you, have, you, you haven't you have unlocked it, or you're one shy away from getting a bonus that you could have gotten if you had taken a different card, or you take a card and then hoping that the next card you get is one that you will be able to use that. You know, you, you put the cash over on your tour and then that card doesn't show up. Those are kind of um, that that reaction of being able to see, no, I made a choice, and that choice affected how my game turned out, for better or worse, you know? And sometimes you're thinking, oh, I could add this to the tour, I could get this, and you go with that, and the next card you get is perfect, and it lines up awesome for you, and it worked out great. But I love that there is the, the thematic element and the, the visual element of, ah, I didn't unlock that yet, or I did get that. And those kind of choices that are highlighted and the, the kind of cause and effect and, and repercussions of those choices that come up, I think this game does a really good job of, of yeah. showcasing that skill of personal responsibility. And my choices have consequences, which is hard to do in a in a game in a lot of ways but is so valuable in life yeah that's a good point so anything else on this one michael i i what about setting that's the one thing i'm curious because we haven't talked I've, about where do you think this game fits best and where where maybe it it isn't as I think it's good a of game, a fit i think it's a game night game or certainly if you are a a family of gamers if you're if you're sitting down and you're able to play distilled with your family <laughs> well yeah if you're playing distilled you know, wingspan, or, you're gonna love draft and write yeah yeah if you're if you're familiar if your family is familiar with gaming and hobby gaming uh as a as kind of a broad category not as we define a hobby game but that difference between casual light and and hobby games i, I think you'll be fine yeah. but i think I think it is for people that know how to play games. Yeah. I'm curious where the floor is on it just because I, I, I don't, um, I, I don't know, you know, can it yeah. work in a middle school library? Could this work at our after school board game club with 12, 13, 14 year olds? I, I don't know. We haven't really tested that, but maybe yeah. we'll, we'll come back to that down the road. Yeah. All right. Well, that is our game of the week draft and write records from inside up games. The School of Gaming. In the School of Gaming, we discuss concepts, keywords, etiquette, and helpful ideas in the world of gaming. This week, folks, we are going to go on a little journey. <laughs> and we are going to take our listeners to the consignment store at Gen Con. But more specifically... We're going to discuss the impact that the consignment store had on us personally. Yeah. Doug, <laughs> lead us into is, the segment. Yeah, there's a lot of lessons and just reflections that I think both of us had after that experience. Now, what is the consignment sale at Gen Con? The same group of, of folks that run the Gen Con auction also run a consignment sale in which folks can sign up, uh, price their games, drop it off. A percentage of the sales go to charity and, and people get rid of their games. They make money, things like that. Um, and then there are some games and things and items, I guess, that are run through the auction. And if nobody bids on them, they can then get moved over to the consignment sale to try and sell again. This year, there were a lot of games. 19,000 games. And 
according to the the Gen Con auction site, almost 12,000 items sold from the consignment store. I kind of divided this into several sections, which was like the pricing, the people, the industry as a whole, and the fallout. So I don't know if you want me to go on a rant and and <laughs> interject when you want. No, or... I like that. Let's also do the comparison where we compare 23 to 24, because to me, they were two sure. very different experiences. And I don't think that was just us. I think there's some things that happened in the hobby and that. Yeah. So. Okay. So as far as the, the first thing, I guess I would put can, in there. Can I is... get my categories again? Just so I can. Yeah. So the, the pricing, yep. the people, yep. the industry, and then the fallout and what we kind of took away from it. So the pricing thing is always interesting to me where you pick up a game and, and the, some of the things for the consignment sale have. Uh, I've committed $35 to this game. I must get $35 out of this game. Yeah. And that was. It was startling to see that many copies of games that were either new and shrink or in great condition, but priced higher than MSRP. And there's a few secondary markets out there right now that have emerged. You know, the Dice Tower Network has a market over on District where a lot of the games that are on there are higher than MSRP or at MSRP when you include the shipping, right? Yeah. And so um, the 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 pricing of games by the players by the collectors um it seems very high when you're yeah. living in a world that the sales are constant yeah right you have options you have retailers who have sales so that was one thing that was a little bit startling i think one of the biggest things for me is when you move on to the people and i don't I, I, I don't know how to say this without sounding disparaging because it's not my intent. But, and I went into, Michael's laughing already. I'm not laughing, went, I'm bracing. I am not okay. laughing, oh, is I'm it bracing. bracing. Right. I'm, so I'm looking at the into, time, I'm thinking about editing that you may I, have to do, go ahead. I went into the sale with a mindset of casually browsing through, all right? I had nothing specific that I was looking for. I had a couple that... I don't know if I happen to come across that. I went in kind of casually and just the the way that you would you and uh, and your spouse would walk downtown uh through a shopping district and be like, "Oh yeah, we'll go into this store." That's how I went in. And I felt like I was amongst rats scurrying to find food. And it made me so uncomfortable. Like the the gotta have it gotta find it rummaging that was going on in there made me uncomfortable and i don't know if that sounds offensive and i don't know if it's the right words i can only describe how i felt and it wasn't necessarily that like it wasn't that the i'm not saying the people were gross or that the you know anything like yeah. that or it was no, it the mentality just, of it was it not was a fun. vibe. It was a mental it, vibe it, it, that was it, it, in that room. It really was. And we were just coming out of an exhibit hall. We were just coming out of, you know, a, a crowded, packed exhibit hall on Thursday. You know, anyone who's covered Gen Con agrees that's probably the busiest day that exhibit hall has ever been. Yeah. And, you know, and, and to go to the consignment store at, at the end of that exhibit hall day, it was a really odd vibe because... I'm going to do a little bit of comparison from last year. This year, apparently, there was 30% more floor space. But when we got in there, games were stacked on the floor two and three deep. You had Marvel under United tables. under the tables. You had Marvel United that was piled 12 feet high. Folks, I, I'm, I'm six foot two. All right. If I extend my hand all the way up in the air, I can get to about eight feet. I could not get to the top of this pile of games. And I think it said a Stephen Strange expansion or something, but I couldn't actually, and I have really good vision too, Doug. Not to, <laughs> but that's just me. I'm, I need to be humble here. I don't know what it was. To the, I, yeah. I'm still curious about what was in that Marvel United box. My approach to the consignment store, which I don't think I'll ever take this approach again, was based on my experiences from 2023. I came home with Pirate's Cove 
a, a, a gem, an out of print game that has been a game of the week here for us um, that I absolutely love. I got it for 40 bucks, you know, at Noble Night at the time. I think it was 80 or 100. So I came home just ecstatic. And so yeah. going into Consignment Store 2024, I was looking for Bruges. I was looking for Cargo Noir. I, I had a handful of games that were out of print that I wanted to get there. And that was just unrealistic. That's like me thinking that we're going to have quiet conversations in the exhibit hall with publishers and designers, right? Yeah. Um, but now I know because we've been there and it, it was a very different vibe. It was, it was like a flea market meets meat market type vibe in, in a, in a time where people are hungry. Uh, well, and because I, it, it, it wasn't violent. I'm not saying that, but there there no. was an edge there. There was a little bit of like a, a pushing in, like, what do you got? What do you got here? Oh, you set down your hand. I'm going to grab it up and see what it is. That just wasn't well, there the previous year. And I think what was weird about it was we you had mentioned the exhibit hall. And it's like we just got done being in the exhibit hall, which had that same type of feel. However, I can... Even though I don't necessarily agree with it, I understand based on the hype and the hotness and the, the, the newness. And this was the exact same mentality fighting over the old and the scraps and the, the, the discarded. And especially yeah. if, you know, and that's what maybe made it weird where it was like, okay, I get it. Everything is new and shiny. And this is like, these are all used games and you're, having that mentality of like gotta get it gotta get it but so there was something else going on in there doug this year that wasn't there last year there were a number of games that were new and shrink that were marked bulk uh takedo duo you know here's five copies of it it's 2015 10 on day one day two day three you know and i'm thinking like oh that's a game that's on my i, I loved takedo duo i'd love to get that yeah. one and so when you see five copies of that, it's not Pandemic Hot Zone where it's always for like $2 down a miniature market. Like There were a lot of games from 2022 and 2023 that were new and shrink where they were in there by the case. You know, there's yeah. five or six of them at a time. And I think that, and it had to be publishers or stores of somewhere that were putting them in the consignment store. Well, Who I don't knows? know if that's I like with yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't know where they came from. But and, that and maybe that's a create, charity thing too. Yeah, that's you know to create a little bit of a different. At least for me, that contributed to the vibe a little bit of like, wait, wait, where's the old garage sale stuff that I'm looking for? Like, where, where's the yeah. old out of print? Like, oh, but I kind of like that new one. Well, if it's here on on day three, I might take that. So it was a very different feel. What were some of the other categories that you wanted to move on from? You have the, so, the people. So the industry, right? And, yes. And Michael always says hype is a commodity in this industry. And the first time I heard him say that, I was like, eh, okay, yeah. And this is where um, it sunk in a little bit, where the amount of games that were great games six months ago that are on the table on the consignment sale that nobody is talking about anymore. Um, things that were hot a year ago at the previous Gen Con that you could pick up a bunch of copies were lying around and not even in the bulk, just used and, and things like that. And it made me think of it, the idea of like, which is, is weird because I guess we're in this position too, but it's like our, our reviewers lying about what's great, Ooh, what's he went good. There. I mean, or what what I think is the reality of it is is that it's really hard to separate good from great. And there are a lot of good games that come out. There are a few great games that come out, and those good ones all blend together. Where it's like, how do you describe a game that's good and you enjoy playing it, but you don't go back to it in six months? Yeah, it still can be a good game, but is it that good if you're not going back to it and people are moving on from it? Well, and what what I have in my notes here is that the line from reviewer and player is blurred in, in almost the same way of what you're talking about with good to great, and that's something to be conscious of. And what I mean by that, if somebody is reviewing games and they 
are attempting to get anywhere from, you know, 75 to 300 titles played in a year. They're going to have a very different approach than somebody who's getting a game every other month, right? Yeah. And I feel like there are more, I don't have the right term for them, but they're not quite hyper consumers or hyper complainers, but the, the, we have a lot of people who are reviewing games. They might not be um, creating content, but they are playing games alongside the people that are creating content. And I think that that combined with the glut of games is where you get to a point where over a three day period, there are 19,000 games in a consignment store, you know, and uh, everything that you just said, I, I agree with to a point and at certain levels. And I was struck very similarly that at one point I looked down and I saw, that's the entire reviewer set that AEG gave us last year. Like that? Yeah. Somebody just took the red AEG bag. I, I think it's red. I, I love that bag. And they just flipped it upside down and said, here you go, consignment store, take this. It's not clear, clear as day on a Thursday. And to me, that was one of those things where it's like, whoa. So you didn't get deep dive and, and, and Point City played? Like, what, what what's what's going on there? Um, yeah. So, and I'm not, I, I'm not making any judgments. I, I have no, no, but, but I, but when I saw that, I thought to myself, like, there's a lot of r reviewers combine that with, there's a lot of games. And then you get this where you now have a whole tent that is full of a whole bunch of games that a whole bunch of reviewers may or may not have even played. Yeah. Well, and I think that I think it, it's a struggle when, like you said, you've got people that are trying to, you know, if you've got what three, yeah, three hundred games, three to five hundred games. If you're doing three or four reviews of games a week, and you're you're playing that, and you're playing five hundred games, trying to get content out for those, and that's only uh, what a. a fifth or a sixth of the number of games that are being published each year and if 80 percent of those are good but not great how do you differentiate from you know this is a good game this well is it could a good be a good game. game for you but a great game for me could be a great game for me but a complete miss for you and that's where yeah and, and then trying to to quantify that i i mean i don't want to toot our own horn but i i feel like the idea of like we talk about the stuff that we like, not because we feel like we need to review it for a specific person, and we are very cognizant of the idea of like, try it. Yeah. Don't don't go out and buy it. Try it and see if you like it because you may be like us and you may love it or you may hate it. Uh, you may listen to us and find out that everything that we love you hate, and and if we ever mention that we don't like something, you that's on your radar to get. But now like, you've got the baseline because we're at least yeah. consistent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so I think it's just getting harder. That that idea of of things blurring, it's harder to keep creating that amount of content and keep it consistent and 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 evaluate when when there is so much middle. Yeah. And, and so little great. So the title of this segment is Impact of Gen Con Consignment Store. Are there other impacts that you have not shared? Because I know we went yeah. one direction here, but anything so, else that... So here's my fallout. Once I left, I kind of thought to myself, like one of those classic, what am I doing? Like yeah. just reevaluating a lot of my collection, my habits, my things. I saw a lot of games that I have had in my collection at one time or another, games that I have played in the past and maybe never owned or did own, games that I liked that I've moved on from, or, I, oh, I played that one time. It was pretty good. You know what I realized? I didn't miss any of them. You didn't All buy it again at the consignment store. Yeah, and, and none of them where I was like, oh, I wish I had that back. Yet when I was, I, I imagine a lot of the times getting rid of those games at the time was, I don't know, I, I kind of like it, I kind of don't, yeah, you know, or am I going to regret getting rid of this? And the overwhelming response that I had for myself was, I don't regret getting rid of any of these games. Yeah. Um, 
I then went on to, if I'm getting rid of games, I need to figure out whether it's space or money. Am I trying to free up space or money? And that changes how I collect and consume, basically changing the way that you think about collecting or consuming games can make a big difference. Yeah. Right? I think I shared in the past episode the idea of, if I think of this more as an experience as opposed to a collection, that changes my mentality for how easy it is or hard to get rid of a game and what I expect to get back out of it. Because if I think of it as a collection, you tend to think of return on investment or yeah. I paid $40 for this, so I should need to get at least 35 so it's not a complete loss. If I think of it as a, uh, a spending an evening with my friends and trying something, I can get nothing for it back and still be okay. And maybe I just donate it or I get my $5 from Noble Knight or whatever it is, and I'm not so concerned about that. So that changed for me. Um, and I think the biggest thing then is, uh, my final point, is trying my best to generate my own hype for games based about what I'm excited about, not what reviewers are excited about. And, and doing my own research and figuring out, okay, yes, every reviewer is talking about this game now. But if it's not hitting on the complexity, the time, the mechanisms, or things that I like, I shouldn't be wasting time or money on it. And rather than listening to reviewers hype up games which is I, the irony of, of being a content creator and, and that, yes, I guess, theoretically, uh, a hype review man. games. A weekly hype man, yeah. Yeah. Um, but that I fall into those traps and, and realizing, okay, what games do I get really excited about for myself and, and, and being more in tune with that as opposed to relying on other people's hype um, are, are kind of some of the things that I took away from this experience this year is that is there any what else do you got yeah i just for me personally it was the the lasting impact is that people overvalue their games right now there is an yeah. inflated value on the worth of a board game uh and and if i start if i frame it there and i know we've talked about this a lot but where the impact for me on that is what are some of those games that are sitting on my hobby shelf to my left or my hobby shelf outside the recording studio that I have moved on from, but I was keeping them because they're either deluxe or it's the ironclad metal version. Um, I should get those out of the house so that other people can actually play them and, yeah. and not in a, a virtue signaling way, but no, it's like, no, I, it's time to, I, I've had a couple of four or five, six for one trade game, something I never would have done prior to going into that sale. I wouldn't trade you four of these big box games or, or five or six of them and have to put them in two different shipping packages just to get one game that I really want to play. Um, and so th that's, that's part of the impact. And the, the other piece is just, um, I, I reduced my budget. So I track all of my board game purchases and I tie it to the school year. So I have a 2022, 23, you know, I have a 2023, 24, and we're just heading into the 2024, 2025 school year. So I have a budget, a fixed amount, um, for all board games. And, and I, I looked at it just very critically and thought that this is my budget for this year. And so it's, it's about, you know, 40% less than the last school year. And, and, and the impact from the 2023 consignment store was I need to play the games that I have, you know, and that yeah. was really the impact from Gen Con overall. And boy, that was just reinforced play the ones that, that I already have that are sitting here alongside me, um, that I'm excited to play and just get into, um, cause there's not going to be a shortage of good games. And I think there's going to be some, some great games coming out. Yeah. 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 Great points there. Let us know in the discord what you think about. Uh, anything that we talked about here or any, any things we may have missed or uh, any reaffirming points, we'd love to hear them. But those are our lessons from the Gen Con consignment sale. Let's move on to the high five.
decreasing pricing as the game go, the days go on. So Thursday the pricing may be twenty dollars. Then on Friday it's eighteen if it doesn't sell, and Saturday it's twelve if it doesn't sell, or something along those lines. And I think that my main takeaway from this is know how to sell your games because the pricing of games on the secondary market has changed a lot in the last 10 years. When I originally got into the hobby, it was not crazy to say, I can pick up this game, try it out, and if I don't like it, maybe I'm losing $5. And and that you could buy a game new for $39.99 and used for about $35 was the, the kind of drop-off. Give an example of a game, like a Days of Wonder type game. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I could, I could get something brand new and shrink for 40 bucks, or buy it on the secondary market for 36 or 35 And And at the time, my thought process was always like, well, I'll just get it new. I'll pay the extra $5. If I don't like it, I can move on from it, and it's going to cost me 5 bucks. And at least if I'm getting it new, I know everything's going to be in, in great yeah, shape. That's a different era. That's and not that the era we are in. that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, However, correct. people are... It was funny to look at those games and see a lot of them where people were pricing them as if that was still... Correct. ...in, in the, the real world. Well, and, and what's you, up with the games that were new and shrink that were priced for thirty five bucks? And when yeah. you can get turn around and get it from Game Nerds or Noble Knight for thirty bucks, or in this, in this case, you could literally go down to the exhibit hall and get it for the the same amount, <laughs> right, right? You know, or less. It's like I can get this with an expansion for five dollars more than you're trying to sell it to me here at the consignment sale, and I I respect and and appreciate. You, you can tell when you pick up a game and when you see it, it's like $25 on Thursday, $15 on Friday, $10 on Sunday because I don't want to take this home. And, and it's a, a $50 board game. Yeah, because that's, folks, I don't know if we, we, you probably said this clearly. I know I cut out for a moment. But Gen Con goes for four days. A consignment sale goes for three. On the fourth yeah. day of Gen Con, you have to pick up your game if you don't sell it. So sellers are incentivized to sell. So you don't yeah. have to take your game home that you di didn't want in the first place because you have it for sale among 19,000 other games. Yeah, so it was interesting to see that and, and just sometimes it makes me chuckle the way that people price that. It's like, do you actually want to sell this? You took the time to, to sign it up for the consignment sale and bring it in here, but the way that you're pricing it makes me feel like you actually don't want to move on to it or you're trying to squeeze every possible penny out of it um well i think, that, I think there's discussion. two things happening there one that's no that's part of this discussion people <laughs> trying to squeeze every single dollar out of the game that they have to maximize value for future games and then two people overvaluing games that they own because of value that they have already put into it yeah whether it's financial or time but if, yeah, if you're anything like us, you're constantly on the hunt for new games to try out. This week, Michael and I are going to talk about our high five essential expansions. My idea behind this is these are games or expansions that I don't want to play the game without them. I feel like they are so good and they integrate so well um, that I need to have them. The one caveat that I will throw out there, which is not on my honorable mentions... Um, but would be in the past is Kingsburg, which the newer versions have increased or uh, basically included what was in the original expansion in yeah, the Yeah, that's game number now. three on my list, folks. So oh, we'll talk sorry. more about the 2009 <laughs> sorry, version of To Forge a Realm in a moment uh, because okay. I had a tie into our last segment. But it's all good, Doug. You didn't know. You didn't all know. Right. I didn't know. I didn't know. No, um, number. F go go ahead. ahead. Yep. Nope. Number five for me. Again, uh, you know, recency bias, really flipping gears, but I loved what Fall Flavors added to Honey Buzz. So if you have Honey Buzz and you love Honey Buzz, if you've played it solo, played it as a family, played it with your game group, uh, Fall Flavors, and again, one play. So what's this guy talking about? What's he really know about it? I liked how the fruit 
worked in the stock market. I liked how some of the new contracts added in. It just added in more to the game. But being able to collect sets of fruit and sell it at the market and then have the overall fruit drop was fun. With that, I said it in the set opening segment when I talked about it, the sunset board. I, I liked a different way to end the game. So um, Honey Buzz is designed by Paul Solomon and art is by uh, Ann Heidseich and Jason Kingsley. Uh, Elf Creek is a publisher. This one just came out, folks, so I mean, I'm not saying you got to run out and get it based on you know everything that we've just been saying, but if you get a chance to check it out, um, it's, it's a cool little expansion. There's some good things going on and, and very, very thematically integrated to the Honey Buzz world, so that's called Fall Flavors. All right, my number five is was originally called the Dice Town Expansion. It's now called Dice Town Wild West. Um, this came out in 2011 by Madigo and, pub- and designers Bruno Catala and Ludovic Mablanc. Um, dice Town is a game in which you are rolling dice, and on the dice are a 9, 10, Jack, King, Queen, Ace, and you are trying to build a poker hand over a series of rolls. And... The way that it and the you know it pays out is, for example, whoever has the most nines gets a, a payout. Whoever has the most ten gets a different payout. And you're collecting different sets and getting points and and all of that, different actions and things. What the Dice Town expansion did is it added a a kind of a secondary prize for each bonus, and I think it really made the game seem a lot more gratifying because there was nothing worse than kind of getting stuck with several numbers you know maybe I've got two nines and two tens and an ace and I've got nothing really and and you get this kind of generic turn at the end to collect something this one maybe I have the second most nines and so I'm getting the secondary bonus on that one maybe I have the second most tens and so it, it was a little bit more satisfying to play the game as opposed to just kind of getting blocked out sometimes. And I really think it helped on that, um, that I, I would never play this game without that expansion just because it, it keeps things moving and, and people are getting more stuff and more interaction as opposed to just the way it's handled in the base game. So that's my number five, Dice Town Wild West. Cool. Game we haven't heard, heard a lot from on the show and one that you, you really enjoy. That's awesome. Um, number four for me, th- this is a little bit of a... J- just, I need a little bit of latitude here, Doug, because I don't want people to run out and do what I did when I first dove into this game. So I, I, I'm coming from a, a place of good here. But I have any root expansion. If you like the game root and you can play it on the ios to figure out if 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 you like it you know nice little app there that you can get for like 10 bucks um and the base game comes with four different factions they all have different um different powers different win conditions it's a race to 30 for the most part in the game root it's not for everybody it is a hobby game designed by cole worley and leader games boy you add an expansion in and they've made, you know, the Marauders expansion, the, the Clockwork expansion, um, the Underworld expansion. Anytime you add one of these expansions in, you're getting a, a new faction and it completely changes the game. I'm not saying you have to run out and get them all and get all the play mats and yeah. get everything that comes with it. That was just me in circa 2021, 20, 22. But um, I'll tell you what, you add an expansion to that game and it really changes it because now suddenly maybe I don't want to play with a Marauder or a Vagabond. You can just add in two of a different one and and, um, it really increases the replayability, but that's for a game that's almost become like a lifestyle game for for a lot of people. But for me, um, kind of in my house and with with my family that, that plays this at the holiday time occasionally when we can, um, those expansions really do uh, that essentials a little bit of a leap. There's yeah. enough there in the base game, and the base game's at Target uh, right now. But man, you add in just any one of those expansions, and and the game takes on a whole whole different life. So that's that's my number four is Root. Yeah, I had a game like that in my honorable mentions, which is Marvel Champions, 
which is a I'm game where you're taking that can... off my list now too, Doug. You're a liar. I'm messing with you. <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. a liar. <laughs> um, but another game where it's like, yeah, add an expansion character if you love Cyclops, yeah. get the Cyclops pack, and and that where it's a completely different character, the same way that Root is, where it's almost adding a new element to the game. Yep. That's interchangeable and swappable. So I had a couple of things like that where I thought of, yeah, I, I would. You know, if you love it, go get it. Um, my number four is really like a quality of life expansion that boggles my mind that this is not included in the base game yet. I still looked it up on Amazon to see if you can buy this to make sure that it was still an expansion that's required. And that is, and, and maybe in some ways could be my number one. And that is the Ticket to Ride USA 1910 expansion. This expansion, the primary thing that it does is it's got some new trade routes and stuff, but it gives you regular size train cards instead of the Hobbit cards that come in the base Ticket to Ride USA game. So if you want regular size train cards, you need to get the Ticket to Ride USA 1910 expansion. And I cannot believe that that game has not been updated yet to include full size cards. Interesting. Um, it adds a couple of different longer routes and kind of balances out some of the route stuff. But primarily, I got this expansion because, like, I cannot shuffle tiny cards. My yeah. hands are too fat. I cannot shuffle them without no. bending them into <laughs> oblivion. Nobody can, Doug. Nobody can <laughs> shuffle those tiny cards. It's not just you. I got to get Molly. I got to get my youngest daughter yeah, to do that. You're right. You got to get Trade a six-year-old it. who has the ability to shuffle cards like a blackjack dealer. I yeah. apologize. <laughs> one person can. She happens to be your six-year-old. Yeah. That's a good one. That's a really so good pull. That's That, for me, is essential. If you bring out Ticket to Ride and you got those original cards, uh, I'm, I got to find a different table to play at. Ticket to Ride <laughs> USA 1910. That's good stuff. We already heard my number three, but I'll just say it again. <laughs> I'll say why. Uh, Kingsburg to Forge a Realm is a 2009 expansion that it is so essential that future printings included it in their base game. Yeah, I happen to prefer um, the art and the addition that the that the to Forge a Realm came out with. It's from Fantasy Flight, um, the base Kingsburg game, and what to for. Uh, I'm a little bit of a word mess here. <laughs> the game to forge a realm, what it adds, it adds different governors that have almost different uh, abilities and, and, and um, conditions or, or give you bonuses um, and help with different resources um, that just it's, make the game more fun to play. Go ahead. Yeah, it's got um, it's got a couple of different modules. One, it allows you to have a more diverse section of, of buildings to to build and acquire so everybody's not building the same tracks um, is a big part of it. It has some uh, chip and card based uh, mechanisms for fighting that you can use different tiles and what gets left over. There's some nobles and things like that that get added in. And so there's like three or four different things that um, you can add in, but just really enhance the the game. And and well, it would definitely be on my list, um, probably fairly high because I think it's so essential. But like Michael said, you know, it's so essential that they just started adding all of those things well, into the base. New game. publishers did, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's the only way that I prefer to play Kingsburg when I play Kingsburg. I must play with the to Forge a Realm expansion. So that's my yeah. number three. Yep, and they're still trying to figure out how to uh, to uh, reprint that to, to get it to stick. I feel like I think there's a third version of that coming out. There is, yep, um, very soon. And and nobody seems to be able to match the... the Fantasy Flight version. Yeah, the, the quirkiness and the artwork that, that seemed to, well, to, to do so well. So interesting. My number three is um, from one of our games of the week, King of Tokyo, and that is the Power Up expansion. This came out in 2012 from Yellow and Richard Garfield. The Power Up expansion, um, in the base game of King of Tokyo, you control a monster, 
and you are rolling dice, and everyone's monster pretty much functions the same way. Yes, I have the the uh, giant gorilla version, and, and Michael's playing with the, the, the lizard, and somebody else is playing with the cyber bunny, but for all intents and purposes, the only thing that's different about our characters is the standee that represents them. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. The, the power-up expansion gives each monster their own little ability deck deck that you can unlock by rolling three hearts so uh which is something that you rarely go after unless you're really hurt there's there's not a huge time that you would want to pursue that but it it makes some of those dice combinations more valuable of oh i'm going to i'm going to try and do that and then i get a permanent ability or something that makes my monster unique and different. And I think it makes the uh, a very simple game into that next little level up without being overly complex or cumbersome. This is something that most people could add in very quickly. Yeah. And and I think it's easier to it's it's great in the base game that they have probably fifty some cards of energy abilities that you can pay for with energy. But I feel like every game I play of King of Tokyo, people just aren't buying those very much because you want to go after points and attacking and healing. And so I think the power up thing, giving you my, you know, giving each person their own personal deck of of upgrades just adds a lot to, to making my character feel unique. So that's my number three King of Tokyo power up. That's a great one, Doug. I didn't even think of that. And I it's such an awesome expansion. It adds so much with a- adding just two sentences to the rules teach. Um, number two for me is a game that I think I love more than most. It's based off of one of the most famous games in the last five years uh, to be published. It's actually the third expansion in the series. It's one where we saw the designer at the AEG booth at Gen Con. And I just wanted to like run up to her and tell her, I love wingspan Asia. Uh, but I avoided that fanboy moment and did not scare Elizabeth Hargrave by telling her great game, but here's why I love wingspan Asia. Great way to play solo, great way to play two-player. I don't ever need to play Wingspan at five or six players. The game does all three of those things. You can play it solo, you can play it with two, or it adds a fifth or sixth player. Where I think this game gets lost in the Wingspan-ness of the Wingspan universe is it's the third expansion. So by the time this thing came out in 2022, people were already heavily invested in the... uh, oceans and whatever the the second expansion was or the first or second expansion i know i have them out of order but for me this was the first i this was just the right game for me at the right time Mm. i played it when i was playing a lot of solo games i was just coming off of a few different plays of wingspan i got it was so darn affordable it was like 24 25 bucks that when it first came out and um you know obviously people love it because it's the number ninth family game it's the number 69th strategy game, and it's ranked 106 overall on Board Game Geek. Not Wingspan, but Wingspan Asia is. Yeah. Uh, but it's one I just don't hear a lot about, and I think you know there's such a familiarness with Wingspan. Um, it's it's hard to say that it's an essential, but for me, I'm actually I, I would keep this one longer than I would keep the base game, just because hmm. I, I could get it. Played with myself table. or one uh, exactly one other person, um, and enough other people have wingspan where I don't have to be the one that has it. So yeah. that's where it's it's a weird one because it's an essential yeah. expansion, but maybe for me only. So <laughs> hey, that's all that matters. It's just essential to you. Um, my number two is a, an expansion that I think gives focus to a game that can be hard to teach, and I think helps guide players right out of the gate and that is the seven wonders leaders expansion Mm. Um, this came out in 2011 by repos production and designer antoine bauza and this is one that i really don't have a hard time adding into a game when i play it because a lot of times in drafting games there is that thing and we've talked about in the show in the past where 
what do these cards do? What do I want to go after? What's my strategy? What should I collect? Because essentially in this game, it's entirely drafting and the world is your oyster. Where do you want to go? And in Seven Wonders Leader, there's a small drafting round right before the game begins that gives you either three or four leader cards. And you can play one leader per age, and there are three ages in the game. And and I think you may just end up with three. So theoretically, you can play one leader per age. But those leaders give you a direction. So they're giving you points for certain things. And, it, you know, you might have a leader that's encouraging you to go after the money cards or the civic cards. Or it's like, ooh, this one will work really well with military. And so just that little focus out of the gate just gets people on a path. Doesn't necessarily mean it's the right path. Yeah but it's a path to get playing the game. And that's why I think this one is really good for that. It was one, the first time I played, I was like, yes, I like this because I, it gives me something to go for. It gives yep. me some sort of guidance, and I think it's really important in a drafting game, especially on a first or second playthrough. And so that is my number two, Seven Wonders Leaders. That's great. My number one, if we have crossover, just give me a little nod so I don't go on for two minutes. I all know that I'm sharing these two minutes with you. Uh, in episode 155, our game of the week was Lost Ruins of Arnak. I would say I'm not getting the nod from Doug, so I'm, I'm going to go all in on my number one essential expansion. If you like Lost Ruins of Arnak, their second expansion is called The Missing Expedition. It came out in 2023. Uh, to me, that is an absolute essential expansion. Uh, the first expansion that came out is titled Expedition Leaders, and, and it's very similar to what Doug just talked about with Seven Wonders, where you have a leader that's going to give you some bonuses and kind of give you a push of where to go. Well, the, the expansion that I feel is essential is the Missing Expedition because it adds a campaign element that could be played solo or two player has some decent storytelling in it as well, but it's just an outstanding way to extend an awesome game in a very different way, right? Lost Ruins of Arnak. What is it? Is it kind of a worker placement? Is it kind of a deck builder? Well, folks, we're already well over an hour and a half into this episode. So if you want to hear more about Lost Ruins of Arnak, just go back and listen to episode 155. We love that game. I love that game. Doug, do you love that game? I love that game. Yeah. And I think it will make sense why the Missing Expedition is my favorite um, or essential expansion of all time. I I, I won't ever separate it from, from the base game. It was released at Gen Con 2023. Um, it always makes me think of my good buddy Doug. And uh, it adds some really cool cards and two really cool leaders to a game with a, a campaign option as well. Yeah, great choice. I had the, the expedition leaders as a, an honorable mention, um, and the, the campaign one's awesome as well. So I've enjoyed playing that one. Uh, my number one is Castle Panic Wizards Tower. All right. And published in 2011 by Fireside Games and designer Justin DeWitt. This is a game that if you play the just the base Castle Panic is an awesome game. The Wizard's Tower adds a little bit more um, punch to the, the threat level, makes it a little bit harder, but it gives you more powerful cards to balance that out. So it's really quick to in, and easy to add in. And having those special power cards makes you feel like you can do some serious damage but as a result, the, the monsters are more powerful as well. So it balances it out, and it's one of those where, in a lot of cases with base Castle Panic, if you know what you're doing and you've played it a lot, it can get fairly repetitive, and, and yeah, you're going to win 90% of the time. This one adds that other wrinkle in, and you're adding a, a special wizard's tower in one of your, your six tower spaces, and if that tower goes away you can no longer draw the special wizard cards. So it's like you're trying to protect that one, and sometimes things happen, and it just adds another wrinkle of, a, of, of threat, suspense, and action to the game that I think really elevates this into a different tier for me as opposed to just the base game. So that is my number one, Castle Panic Wizard's Tower. That's awesome. 
Um, Any other honorable yeah, mentions I have, for I have you? some honorable mention. Lords of Waterdeep, Scoundrels of Skullport. It's an honorable mention for me because I haven't actually played it yet, folks. And I got to be honest with our listeners. I have it. <laughs> it's just sitting in the shrink. And I yeah. haven't actually gotten back to Lords of Waterdeep since playing it with you on vacation two years ago, Doug. Wow. Um, yes, but that's one that everybody talks about. So that's why I yep. threw it an honorable mention just to make sure that we at least covered it. Uh, I have one other one, but I'll send it over to you. Do you have others? Uh, one of them that I have is uh, Dice Throne Adventures, which oh, is uh, not, a, not a base game. It does not come with any characters that you can use right out of the box. How's that and, not number one for one of us? Yeah, and I think what really works well for it is that it it takes existing content that you have and gives you a completely different way to play it. I don't know if I would love Dice Throne as much as I do if it wasn't for Dice Throne Adventures. I love the back and forth combat of Dice Thrones, but bringing it into a cooperative universe with a dungeon crawl really put it over the edge for me. Yeah, that's that's great. I have um, a lot of love for the game Everdell. Like like mm. Doug just mentioned, Dice Throne. I have a lot of love for that game and that series as well. So I, I had a hard time picking one expansion. So I thought, you know, I'll split the difference and just put two of them on the honorable mention. I think the Pearl Brook expansion with adding a, a little pond and some awesome frogs, like an extra worker frog on the left side of the board, is a ton of fun. So if any of our listeners have the collector's edition, you're like, oh, which expansion should I go to first? I think a next awesome expansion into the Everdell universe is is Pearl Brook. Um, and then I also like Spirecrest. Spirecrest mm -hmm. is an, another one that just adds adds a, some other characters and parts of the board that, that make that game a lot of fun. And I, I got my frogs mixed up. Spirecrest has these little um, frog ambassadors. I don't need to go deeper in Everdell. We're already a long ways in. But both those expansions, I don't think they're essential. I think there's enough yeah. in just the base Everdell game. Sure. But I appreciate the heck out of what James A. and Clarissa Wilson with Andrew Bosley's amazing art have done to just add that little universe out. You know, I'm glad they didn't just stop at the base game. So Yeah. Awesome. Um, and then let's see. Yeah. No, that's it for me. Anything else for you? Oh. All right. So. Subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. Follow us on X at GameSchoolerU. Reminder to join the Discord, GameSchooler.com slash Discord, and fill out a review on your podcast platform if you haven't done that already, if you enjoy what we're doing. Next week, we're I, tentatively, we're going to be talking about post office. When do you import a game? And our favorite combat resolution systems. Thank you so much for spending the last hour and a half or so with us. We truly appreciate it. Now get out there and keep gaming.